Good morning. You might take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians 5. We'll look there for just a moment, and then we will go to some other passages. Ephesians 5. It is so good to see you. We have a number of visitors with us, and we're thankful for your presence. And uh, if there is anything that we say or do here that you have questions about, whether it's something we do that you're not quite sure about or something we didn't do that you expected to see, uh, we hope you'll ask us about that and allow us to explain why we're doing what we're doing here this morning. And that is at least somewhat in line with what I want to think about today. But we are thankful for your presence and hope that you find your time here to be a time where you're appointed heavenward, where we're thinking about God and His Word. Uh, several weeks ago, um, in our uh, in one of the lessons that I preached, it might, might have been the first one of the year, I, I thought about approaching God in worship. And I, I talked about that parable uh, that Jesus told of the man who came into the presence of the king without his wedding garment on. And I don't know that that, that parable is primarily about what clothes we wear when we come to the Lord's presence. That might be a part of it. But I do think it's about the kind of attitude with which we come into the presence of God. And so that kind of got me thinking, I wonder if there was a way, and, and certainly there is, where we could think about the aspects of our worship and think about how we would do that with a wedding garment on. How would we engage in certain aspects of our worship in a way that is appropriate and shows a proper awareness of what we're doing and shows a proper appreciation for the fact that we're coming into God's presence. And so over the course of the next several months, I, I want to sprinkle in some of those lessons from time to time. And I want to begin by thinking about a lesson regarding our singing, considering our singing. And I would say that I think, and I might be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. I don't think I am generally about things. Um, I, I think that we would consider ourselves to be a singing group. Right? There are congregations that I know of that would rather skip that part. Right, I don't think we're one of those, I, I, mostly because of how bad the preaching is. But uh, we, we don't want to skip right to it. We want, I, but we want to take time for our singing, uh, and we put an emphasis on that. And that goes back a long time where folks have come in to help us and work on that, and we have uh, taken time even uh, in the last several years to have classes where we're looking at the songs and we're thinking about their meaning. We have even the drill class where we're trying to train even the very littlest ones to be equipped to help us uh, as we engage in our singing. We've got men who have developed themselves to be capable song leaders. We have, I would say, on every Sunday, we have 99.9% .9 of the group joining in heartily. And there may be some of you who are laying out on that, and I want to talk about that a little bit. But I think that as a whole, we think about ourselves as a singing group and maybe even have developed a reputation as a singing group. And that's all right. But what I want to think about is that while the singing and the, uh, the vocal aspect of that is vitally important, that nobody sees what goes on in our hearts in that. And so we need to be thinking about that as we go. And what I want to do this morning is talk about some of the motivations of our singing and some of the effects of our singing, and then maybe draw some uh, applications from that so that we can make sure that as we engage in this aspect of our worship, which is a large chunk of our worship, uh, we, the only thing we spend more time doing is, is hearing God's Word. Uh, and so if we're going to approach God rightly, we've got to approach Him rightly in this aspect of our worship. Because if we don't do it here, then that's a large part of what we're bringing to God that, that's, that's not what we want it to be. So in Ephesians 5 and verse 19, you know this passage well, but I want us to emphasize that he tells them to speak to themselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So there's obviously a vocal aspect to our singing. We are singing and we are speaking to one another, but there is an internal aspect as well. And we cannot approach God rightly with only the vocal part in order. Rather, we must, as the, the song says, uh, O Thou Fount, the, uh, says, uh, tune our hearts to sing thy praise. We want our hearts tuned. We don't want to just be on the right key. We want our hearts to be tuned to sing God's praise. So first, let me think about what is it that motivates our singing? And for this, I want you to turn back to Exodus 15. 
Exodus 15. I believe that Exodus 15 is the first stated recorded song that is sung to God. I'm sure there were other songs that uh, were sung, and I'm sure people sang songs to God before this. But this is the first time where it's recorded. This is the song that they sang to God. And you'll know the setting of Exodus 15. We've talked about it just recently in Bible class. They have come through the Red Sea. Now they're standing on that eastern shore of the Red Sea, and they break out into song, a song of praise and thanksgiving on the far side of the Red Sea. And in this song, notice verses 1 and 2, Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to Yahweh and said, I will sing to Yahweh for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. He is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will extol him. In this context, God has delivered and rescued his people He has defeated their enemies. You see that as you read on through the song. Uh, He is leading them to the promised land. Look at verse 13. In your loving kindness, you have guided the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have led them to your holy habitation. Not only that, but they sing about the fact that he is dwelling among them. Verse 17, you will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance to the place, O Yahweh, which you have made for you to inhabit. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. And finally, they close out the song with a celebration that God will rule forever. Yahweh shall reign forever and ever. Eighteen, uh, Verse 18. So, all of these things God has done. He has redeemed them. He has won victory for them. He is guiding them. He is dwelling among them. He is reigning over them. And what do they do? In view of all of those blessings... What do the people of God do? They sing. They sing. What kinds of things do they sing about? They sing about God's strength. They sing about His holiness. They sing about His faithfulness and more. And if it's it's as if in view of who God is and what He has done, what He's just done for the people of Israel, they cannot help but burst out in song. And if that was true of those people, How much more should an awareness of God's salvation brought about in Christ cause us to break out in song? It's as if we stand on our own eastern shore of our own Red Sea with our enemy defeated and death destroyed. We have been saved. So we sink. We sink. Can we not sing of deliverance? You don't have to turn to all these passages. Can we not sing of deliverance? Paul said in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, In Him we have redemption. The very same word to talk about their rescue from Egyptian slavery. In Him we have redemption, but not just from Pharaoh, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of His mercy. By His blood, according to the riches of His mercy. Can't we sing about victory over our enemies? Uh, In Colossians chapter 2, uh, Paul talks about what they experienced. When they were baptized, they were buried with Christ in baptism, and they were raised through, raised up through faith in the working of God. And he says in verse 14 that what Christ did in our baptism, because of what He did on the cross, was He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He also has taken that out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Our enemy which in part was our sin and our record against us and Satan's claims over us because of that, they have been nailed to the cross. And Paul says in verse 15, having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them in him. I think the idea there is that what Christ accomplished on the cross and what we, what we tapped into in our baptism was the victory that Jesus won, not over the physical earthly kingdoms, but the victory that He won in the spiritual realm, where He defeated and broke the power of Satan, and broke the power that sin had against us, and broke the power of death that loomed over us. And in Christ, we have great victory. We can sing about God's leading us to the promised land, um, Peter reflects on this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has begotten us to a living hope by the resurrection from the dead, to an inheritance. That's the same word they use when they talk about where God was living. To an inheritance, which is not like Canaan. No, this inheritance is imperishable and undefiled and fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are being kept by the power of God through faith. And so God leads us and He guides us home. We can sing about God dwelling among us. In 1 Corinthians 3 and in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul makes the point, both in a, I think in a congregational context in chapter 3 and in an individual way in chapter 6, that we are the dwelling place of God by the Spirit. That God's Spirit dwells in us. And that's why we should first pursue unity, chapter 3. We are God's temple where God's Spirit dwells. And we should pursue holiness, chapter 6, uh, because we don't use our bodies just for anything. We are set apart for God's purposes. And of course, we can sing about God's reign over us. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul, in his thanksgiving for the Colossians and for what God had done for the Colossians, he said that God rescued us from, this is verse 13, the domain or the authority of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. I realize I went through those quickly. All I wanted to do is emphasize that if the Israelites could sing about things like redemption and victory and being guided to a, an, an inheritance and God dwelling among them and God reigning them, if they could sing about that, how much more so can we? How much more so can we? And so if they had a glimpse of God's strength, if they had a glimpse of God's holiness and His faithfulness in their redemption from Egypt and their journey to Canaan, don't we even more so? And so God's blessings and His provision and His salvation, understood and appreciated, should drive us to sing. There is a song in our book that we do not, do not sing yet. yet. Um, but the second verse of that song, number 396, says, What though the tempest loudly roars, the Lord my Savior liveth. And though the darkness round me close, songs in the night He giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? The idea there is that I look around at the, the tempests and the difficulties and the trials that I must face, and then I think, Christ is King. He reigns. And it gives me a song in the night. And even in the midst of great despair, I can't keep from singing because of what God has done for me in Christ Jesus my Lord. Several passages, especially throughout the Psalms, point to singing as the right and proper response to God's goodness. Um, Landon read for us from Psalm 96. We'll notice one passage from there in just a second. But in Psalm 40, uh, David uh, prays there and he responds there. Evidently, David went through, well, we know he went through several periods of Great calamity, sorrow, personal, uh, communal, however you want to think about that. And in verse 2, talking about one, uh, verse 1, we might as well read there, uh, talking about one of the times where God rescued him, he said, I hoped earnestly for Yahweh, and he inclined to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet on high. He established my steps. Verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and will trust in Yahweh. I don't know. Maybe it's that God inspired a song on that occasion. I think in part it is that as a result of being saved, that's what put the song in David's mouth. How can I keep from singing when God's raised me up from the miry clay, when He's rescued me from the pit, when He has inclined to me and helped me? He put a new song in my mouth when that happened. And so I think it's appropriate that when we realize that God has rescued us from sin or temptation or physical danger, and we respond with song. Uh, Landon read for us from Psalm 96, and I love Psalm 96 because it echoes so many of those themes that they sang about way back in Exodus 15. They sang about them in Exodus 15, and, and the psalmist sings about them in, chapter, uh, in Psalm 96. Uh, Particularly, I'm thinking about verse 2, Sing to Yahweh, 
bless his name, proclaim good news of his salvation from day to day. In view of what? Of God's salvation, of the good news that God has brought to us, we sing. Psalm 98, uh, sing to Yahweh a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand and his holy arm have worked out his salvation. Uh, and then Psalm 105, and we can multiply these. Psalm 105, uh, looking at verse 2, sing to him, sing praises to him. Muse, this translation says, on all his wondrous deeds. Uh, I think it's appropriate for us to contemplate and meditate on all the things God has done. And in view of that, in awareness of his salvation, we sing. Now, I am aware that not everybody's natural inclination to even the best gift would be to sing. And in other arenas of life, that's not typically, I've been given tremendous gifts and I've never broken out in song. Uh, you know, maybe if we were in a Disney musical, that's what would, what would happen. But I've never broken out in song in response to a gift somebody's given me, even when I've been very appreciative. So I realize that an awareness of our salvation motivates us to sing. But that goes, I think, along with that we understand that when we come to God with song, we are bringing him what he asked for. We are responding to His instructions. We know that this is something that God wants from His people. And so when we see His blessing, we respond that way, even if that might not be our natural inclination. Even if that might not be the way we would typically respond to something like that. Um, we know the passages that talk about this being our responsibility. That this is an instruction that God has given us to obey. Colossians 3 and verse 16, a passage we'll look at some more as we come to the end of the lesson, where he talks about letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And we talked about Ephesians 5 and 19. And then Hebrews 13 and verse 15, where the Hebrew writer says that we should bring the sacrifices of praise to God, the fruit of our lips that confess name, His name. It is more than a duty or responsibility, right? It is, it is a privilege, but it, is, it isn't less than a duty. It isn't less than a responsibility. It is something that we are called to do whether that's what we would have liked to do or not. Uh, I want you to think about that. You, you might have an idea and you say, well, I, I don't really like to sing. I'm not really that good of a singer. That's okay. Uh, because when you sing, whatever it sounds like when it comes out of your mouth, if your heart is tuned for praise, you are bringing a sacrifice of praise that is appreciated by the God who made you. He, I, I think about Moses when people say, well, I, you know, I'm not a very good singer. And this, it, doesn't that sound like Moses in Exodus 3 and 4? Where he said, well, I'm not a good speaker. And, and basically what God said is, I, I know how good of a speaker you are or are not. I made your mouth and I made your tongue and I made your... When you sing, you're not surprising God with how you sound, right? He knows what's coming. And he's asked for it from us all anyway. Our songs are a sacrifice that we bring to God. And when we bring our best, we bring what pleases Him. The hymn writer John Newton once wrote, Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen His beauty, are joined to part no more. What Mr. Newton beautifully expressed is that there perhaps was a time where what we wanted to do and what we were supposed to do were not the same thing. But seeing the beauty of who God is and what He has done for us in Christ has a tendency to pull those things together so that what we want to do and what we must do are the same. The, our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen His beauty, are joined apart no more. I think some of you can probably sympathize that when it comes to singing. Well, what I wanted to do and what I was told to do maybe weren't the same thing. But as we contemplate the goodness of God and that He has asked for this as a sacrifice of praise, we say, 
I want to do it. <clears throat> even when I don't want to, I want to. because And I want to cultivate a desire to do that even more. Let me, I want to take a little bit of time and think about that we remember that God's instructions are always for our good. When He calls us to sing, He doesn't call us to do something that is just a spinning our wheels. He calls us to do something that is for our good. And the way I know that is because His commandments are always for our good. I think that it's possible that you come to the services and you think, I don't really want to sing. It's kind of a burden on me. It's difficult. I don't enjoy that. John would say in 1 John 5 verse 3, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. And you say, well, that one might be. No, no. None of them are burdensome. They might be difficult for you. They might be hard for you to, to follow, but they're not burdensome because He's not just seeing how high we'll jump. He's not just seeing if we'll do things that we don't want to do. What He's doing is He's cultivating something in us with every command He gives. I, I think about this. I was studying Leviticus. We're teaching that in the younger class. And I have made the comment, and I've heard it made, and I don't think anybody meant anything bad about it when they said it. But when we talk about the old law and we say, boy, aren't we glad we don't have to do all that? Do you think that's how the Israelites thought of it? I'm sure eventually they did. Do you think that's how they thought of it initially? Or people who were spiritually minded thought about those things? I think a person who was rightly thinking about the law said, what a privilege that God has given us these means by which us, we as unholy people, could dwell in the presence of a holy God. I think the sacrifices, I think the rituals, I think the cleansings, I think all of that by the right thinking person would have been understood as a grace, as a mercy to be able to draw near to God. And that's what our singing is. Our singing is an opportunity for us to draw near into God's throne room with praise. What a privilege. What a mercy. What a grace. It's always for our good. One, it is one way by which God's Word dwells in us. Ephesians 3 verse 16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. How? By singing to one another. We, uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 18 talks about not being filled with wine, but being filled with the Spirit. Wow. Well, he continues, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's how God fills us with His Spirit. It's how His Word dwells richly in us, at least one way. One writer said that singing is how we take Sunday's truths into Monday. I like that. I think that's right. It's how we take Sunday's truths into Monday. Songs can help us in time of trial. Uh, they remind us of God's faithfulness to us. They help keep our mind on eternity. We sang a song this morning, when we all get to heaven. How many times have you gone throughout your day with, let us then be true and faithful, ringing in your ears. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. If we could have that ringing through our ears Monday through Saturday, that would help us a lot. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. If that could echo in our hearts, if we could take that Sunday truth into Monday, wouldn't we be better off? And God does that for our good. He knows that singing engages every part of us. Our, our hearts, our minds, our, our actual bodies. And so it's one way by which God's Word dwells in our heart. It, it is one way by which we express gratitude to God which is absolutely essential. Um, and you say, well, that's more like obeying another command. Yes, but we can see all the ways in which gratitude is for our good. And so if singing helps me cultivate gratitude, then I think I want to do more of it. Colossians 3 and verse 16 says that we're singing with gratefulness in our hearts to God. In, in Ephesians, it's chapter... It's chapter 5, verse 19 is about singing, and the verse 20 is always giving thanks. You see how it's so closely connected. James 5, verse 13. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. One thing that I note about Bible people all the way through, Old Testament, New Testament, is when something good happens to them, do you know who they credit it with credit credit it to? The Lord. Every time. I, I was I was thinking about Elizabeth. 
um, in Luke chapter 1. And I've been studying that lately. And I was thinking about when she is given, she conceives John. And what does she say? She says, the Lord has taken away my reproach. That's where her attention turns. And I think as we go throughout the scriptures, we would find that people who are blessed recognize God's hand in it all along the way. Godly people recognize God's hand in it. Well, singing helps us to cultivate that sense of God's hand in the things that we're blessed with. And I think that would be a benefit to us to cultivate even more. Um, when we sing, we do what we were made to do. I think there's some of that in the psalm that Landon read for us, where it talks about the trees and the fields and the oceans exalting and praising God. All of creation testifies to the glory of God. And you know, that's what we were made to do. The difference is, is that we have a free will. And we tend not to do that. But it's what we were made to do because it's what all creation was made to do. I think we see that in the 100th Psalm just really quickly because uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, Psalm 100, he says, Make a loud shout to Yahweh all the earth. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that Yahweh, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Seems to me that the right response to the fact that God made us is that we sing to Him. Now, let's take that to a new covenant perspective. In Ephesians 2, same book that we're referencing a lot with Ephesians 5, Paul refers to the fact that we as Christians are God's sanctuary. We are His temple. In Ephesians 5 and verse 22, he says we're being, uh, 2 and verse 22, we're being built into a holy house where God's Spirit dwells. Well, how does that happen? Well, one way we're filled by the Spirit is that we sing those songs, Ephesians 5, 19. And then you connect that with what he says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, what the Hebrew writer says. I didn't mean to imply that Paul said it in Hebrews 13, 15. What he implies there is that these are sacrifices of praise and what that means is, is that as we sing songs, we become the fulfillment of what the temple was always pointing to. Of what God always wanted. Was not a physical structure, but people who brought Him praise. And that's why we do that. Okay. And finally, on that, it's one way we encourage and stir up one another. Which is one of the reasons we come together. I would say one of the, the two or three major reasons we come together is to encourage and to stir up one another. And that's what those passages talk about our singing doing. Do you remember Paul's admonition in Ephesians 4 verse 29? I know the ones in the drill class do. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good for the building up of the moment so that it may give grace to those who hear. How can I ensure that the words that I'm singing, saying are words that are going to be building up and edifying and give grace. But when I'm singing God's words to each other, that is one way to accomplish that, that uh, instruction. It is an expression of love and unity. In Colossians, in that context, the very last thing Paul says right before that is that we should put on love and bind ourselves together. And when we all sing, you know, maybe the leader gets up and leads a song that we don't particularly love. It's not our favorite. But we say, you know, there's, there's truth here. And we sing that song to one another. Or he sings it slower than I would have sung it. And we sing it. Or maybe he didn't sing the verse that I want to sing. But we, we follow his instruction. And we sing to one another. I think that's a powerful display of unity. Uh, of, of camaraderie, if we can use that word. Of partnership in what we're doing. I say that in part. Because of what Paul says in Romans 15. Um, in, you know Romans 15 because you know Romans 14. And it just so happens that that comes right before Romans 15. And in Romans 14, he's talking a lot about being unified even in places where we disagree. And finding ways to work together even over difficult subjects. And in verse 7 of chapter 15, he says, Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the uncircumcision, 
uh, to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. It is written, therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. I take it to be that what the prophet was pointing to was a day where either the Messiah or God's people would sing God's praise among the Gentiles, among the nations. And Paul uses that as, as support and as evidence that we should work together and that we should be unified together. That God's intention all along was that we would sing and unify together in our praise of God. I want you to think about something. Think about that Roman congregation. And um, and I don't know that they, they didn't have the songs that we have. But um, we they are coming together in that assembly. They've got frustrations that they're having to deal with with one another. And imagine they're sitting together in that assembly and they sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. Or how, how sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word. You think about the songs that we sing that are encouraging one another and how if we will ponder them, they will melt away so many of the things that are irrelevant. Uh, I was listening to a lesson about singing, and it talked about the fact that, you know, in a football stadium, they all sing together from time to time, whether it's a fight song or something else. And what they want to do is they want to use something that is wildly unimportant, which is ball, to melt away all the other, uh, all the other distinctions among them, right? Race or class or gender or whatever melts away in whatever colors your team is. Well, that doesn't work, right? Because that's not something that's unifying enough. But I'll tell you what can melt away all of the insignificant markers of us is our unity in Christ. And I think our singing reflects that at least to some extent. Okay. Finally, singing is a sacrifice. So we want to come before God with what He has asked for. And we want to come with the appropriate focus in our hearts. We want to bring God what pleases Him because they are sacrifices for Him. They're not for me. And so we sing because when we look through the New Testament and we see what God asked for was singing. And somebody says, why not play instruments? Well, first of all, because when I'm bringing my offering to God, I want Him to be honored and I want Him to be glorified, so I'll let Him dictate what it looks like. But I will say, secondly, that all of the things we have talked about about motivating and, and the effects of singing, at best, instruments are unnecessary for that, right? In order to accomplish the things that are for our good, you got to have the words, right? The words are the thing that cultivate those attitudes in us. Now, there may be questions arise about that, and that's one of those things. I'm happy to talk about why we just sing and don't play instruments. But let's start with, we're going to let God dictate what we bring. And then we'll figure that we'll figure out what that looks like as we go. But I also want to think about the attitude that I have. I'm coming before God and I know that God hears more than just what's coming out of my mouth. He hears what my heart is saying too. And if it's filled with pride or if it's filled with apathy or if it's disengaged, he sees that too. And so I want to very carefully approach God as I come before Him in song. Well, maybe there's some practical things we can think about, about how we do our singing and things like that, but we'll have to save those for another time. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We're going to sing a song now, and it is intended to encourage us in whatever areas of our life are out of step with God's will to correct that and to come to God with not just our, our voices, not just our singing, but with our whole hearts, our whole lives, as living sacrifices to God. That's our reasonable service. And so if you see areas in your life where what, what God has asked for you to bring and what you are bringing are out of line, then the reason we're going to sing this song is because we want to encourage you to get those things in harmony. Get those things in harmony. Um, we want to encourage you. And we want to help you in any way that we can to be right with your maker. And so if there's a way that we can do that this morning, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.